guys we're at CB again and this is where something quite I don't know different or unusual for see at CB this year we have a mode of transportation we're here with Damien from Vic uh, the Vic uh, Vic Hyper Hyperloop uh, group association uh, team when it was student team yeah, yeah team and basically we're going to give you guys an overview of what this uh, emerging tech is for those who don't know what it is I'll hand it over to Damien so Hyperloop is a relatively new concept um, it's a transportation system that runs in vacuum tubes up to 1200k an hour. So by using technology such as linear motors and eddy current brakes as well as maglev, we can reach these speeds. Damien, where's the power, uh, where's the power source? Is it from gravity or...? So the power source is through batteries which we can power through solar panels yep. um, which can create a carbon neutral energy. So maybe if since the 70s and 80s there have been similar projects that you know dig a hole through the earth and send a vehicle like this through you know down semi power down from gravity and you're supposed to use a vacuum and so on coming out the other side of the earth is this sort of the same concept or in a different flavor different flavor um, this is a land-based um, transportation okay. system that travels above ground in these tubes and it's essentially a lot more efficient than. So, Damon, some, some, you know, most people would have heard of a maglev. What's the difference between a hyperloop and a maglev? So, a maglev, maglev train usually runs outside. So, by that you get friction from air. So that reduces the, the efficiency of your system. Okay. So, a hyperloop is run in a vacuum tube. So it's a lot more efficient. So basically, it's just a tradi traditional and quite much ground-based transportation. You're just going to close it in a, in a container to get rid of some of the physics limitations that have been limiting different legacy forms of transportation. So David, let's. Uh, I think let's uh, before we look at the vehicle, let's just have a very quick overview of how the team came about and the corporate side of very just very, very vague. So we can have a basis on where things have come so far before we look at the vehicle. Yep. So people first, uh, there were two team leaders who come from rural Victoria and New South Wales. Oh, well, that, that explains the initiative. And they were sick of travelling to obviously Melbourne, so they were having a look around at innovation in tech and they came across Elon Musk's white paper which was a Hyperloop system. So from there there was a competition that came about in which they started to gather a team together and really that's when it all began rolling. So is this a direct implementation of that Musk white paper or very variation? Yep, so it's, we actually ran in his uh, student com competition okay. um, which um, finally took off in January of 2017 where we actually okay. flew over Quite to recent, the States. Yeah. Yeah. That explains a lot, so we haven't really heard of you know you guys are on the cutting edge of things. <laughs> so from there um, we're actually turning into a company and we're looking at actually developing Hyperloop technology and eventually building a Hyperloop system in Australia. So in terms of prototyping say you need to build a prototype track what's the practical length to build a prototype track do you think so a fair couple of k's okay um, hyperloop one has started building a track and it's 500 meters long but okay you can't really get up to full speed so of course they're looking at and i assume because we're in the back maybe gradients are not that of a big deal so when you're going at 1200k an yeah. hour um, gradients are sort of an issue, so you want to... So you need to, you know, um, go downhill to decelerate and use that energy to go back up, or is it? We, we can do that, there's many different options behind it, but ideally what we want to track that's as flat as it can be. Okay. So Australia is a good um, country to do it in, because we're but I think we're going to find issues if you're going to, we're looking at the Sydney-Melbourne corridor, we're going to have big issues with that if you want to do it as far as possible. Yeah, so in regions where we need to, we can actually go underground okay. and above ground. Okay. So ideally, we want it on ground. Okay, Damon, so if you don't mind, let's have a walk walk around of the vehicle. Yep, we got a full carbon shell here, which was designed and built by students. 
Um, here's our logo, obviously, which incorporates both Vic and Hyper together. Pretty much um, going at full speed, it creates 20 kilograms of lift, which in a vehicle this size is not much, but it's at least an effective drag. So production. this bullet-shaped vehicle, what's the body materials? So the body material, we got a carbon shaft okay. as well as an aluminium chassis. Okay, aluminium, so aluminium frame of carbon. Oh, no. yep. Okay. Okay, that's um, so. How long? What's the length of this uh, vehicle? Because it might be difficult for you to comprehend on the camera. So it's 3.6 meters long, oh, and 1.3 wide. So here we have it disassembled. So it's going to look a bit longer than what it actually is. So here we have the cover off. Yep. So we have a um, just uh, what's it, this is just for um, this axle and this these wheels just for trans um, ease of transportation, is it? Yeah. Okay. So the real one wouldn't have wheels. It'd have a maglev yep. system. Um, but with a system of this size, it's easier to transport. So what are we looking here with the electric rack here? So here we have our PLC and our okay. control unit, as well as our batteries display underneath it. So, so at the top, we just have um, terminal blocks, is it? Yeah. To distribute all the, your wiring. Yep. So this was actually done by a couple of students um, who needed a solution for an easy wiring. You know, okay. if we had yep, problems. that makes sense. Yep. Um, you don't want to uh, have a spaghetti loom like a car or something. Yeah, exactly. So, yep. so these large wires here, I assume they're the ma main power for the. Yep. So, so this would use linear motors. Yep. So we got our eddy current brakes underneath there, yep. which you can't. Are we able to see the linear motors here, or is it too packed in the? Down there, I don't know whether you can see it, but these were actually designed by a student, and we actually got special recognition for such a feat of engineering. So is that under the yep, aluminium so frame? It's a block here okay, with, with a, a sticker with the yellow. Okay. Ah, okay. So just. Oh, okay, I see it's sort of like a, I can see the winding. Yep. I can sort of see the winding, and you have the. Um, <laughs> it looks um, like we don't yeah. know what it's called. That thingy. Um. <laughs> okay, so you have, so you have a, a column of those going through the vehicle yeah, to make so the linear we got motor. One on each side, um, which provide our braking force. So we're able to stop a 20 kilogram disc um, rotating at 100 kilometers per hour in 2.5 seconds. So it's leading edge innovation in tech. Okay, so just so we're clear, we have the linear motor that's for traction and for braking. Yep. Okay. So you can accelerate the vehicle with your linear motor, but you can also brake it and put And power so into it. through that concept, it's basically self charging, is it? To an extent, yes. Um, you can't exactly extract all the energy back into it but you can recharge it by using the solar panels that are on top of the tube. Okay, so to a degree it's self-maintaining, but yeah. at a point you're going to have to give it like a major charge, say yeah. before a journey or yeah. overnight between stops or something like yeah. that. So we'd have a modular system where we can pull the batteries out, yeah. put new ones in and so, charge them back. Look, I do understand this is a you know, research project and so on, but a lot of these technologies are actually you know, people can find them in the real world. I mean, the Sydney trams we're getting, they have induction system and so on. And a lot of these systems, I can see from your sponsors, you have Siemens and so on. Yeah. A lot of these are production technologies. Well, how much, how much tech in this is actually off the shelf and how much is, it, is uh, uh, let's say, breadboard stuff? <laughs> so, most of the tech is actually off the shelf. Um, I mean, obviously, we have the PLCs here, though, off yeah. the shelf. And what about the mo motors? You guys wind it yourself? Or? So, the mo motors we're winding ourselves oh, and <laughs> developing and optimizing. I mean, all of that. So, I mean, all. <laughs> every, everything's been done. Um, in previous industries, but in the way that we're doing it, it's never been done before. Okay. So we're sort of putting a spin on everything and applying it to our. Okay, then so, okay, we're in a vacuum. How does the vehicle track though? Is it from the vacuum or does it need some, some tracking mechanism? Because so, on the maglev, we have the guide rail, obviously. Yeah. So the maglev will have a track, yeah. so that'll be our guide. Um, and then we'd have stability systems. Um, we're thinking electromagnetic. Uh, okay, possibly. so magnetic sensor, sensor. Yeah, so. So you're going to start with a guide rail? Yeah. Okay, so just ma ma so basically similar to a magnet. Yeah, yeah, except we're looking at ways to reduce. Okay, the so back to this rack here. So we have the wiring in the top. And um, if we have some loom, is there anything else in this sensor demonstration uh, capsule here, I guess? 
Um, we got our uh, vessel here, which is kept at normal atmospheric conditions, because we didn't have the money or the time to test all the electronics. Uh, okay, what about temperature? We um, we kept it at normal atmospheric conditions. Okay, so because you put it in the case, then yep. it's going to be saying maybe I don't know room temperature or something like that. Is it? Yeah, no need to worry about cryogenic. We um, have temperature sensors within the vessel to be able to monitor that. Um, obviously in their larger vehicle we'd have better cooling systems. So I know I know a little bit about science but just just so for my audience and myself we're on the same page. Say we didn't have this internal containment for the electronics package. Yep. What's gonna to happen to the electronics in the vacuum? Was it gonna boil or is it gonna fry or we're, freeze? What's we're gonna not too sure because this system <laughs> But in theory what's been. supposed to happen in the vacuum? Um, it would pretty much fry itself, yes. Yeah, because I think in space when the you know the humans the, the blood boils or something. Yeah. So, but electronics is not really organic, so. Nah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So this capsule, how far along the vehicle does it go? So just maybe so half. It goes. Like? The capsule is that that long. Yep. Um, so this slides in on rails, okay. and then we got an aluminium disc that bolts onto here and provides a seal. So this is all the high voltage stuff here. Yeah. What about low voltage? Say the microprocessor and those sorts of things. Yep. So we have a whole bunch of. Um, I think it's, I'm more of a mechanical. Yeah. Um, but uh, That's as far as I know, um, we have systems in place to be able to drop the voltage down to that. Do you know what the brains of the machine are in terms of you using, say, I know, I'm going to be very vague here, Adreno or some other off-the-shelf microprocessors and so Um, so I think it... Laptop, or using a laptop inside, or what's what's the go of the brains? Pretty sure it's all run through this rack. Okay. Um, and then it So it does, does, it does have onboard computing, it's not like remote? No. Oh, we can have it remote so I'm not talking about, the, I'm not talking about in terms of control I'm talking, does the vehicle need onboard uh, control, you know smarts no so that can all be autonomous so we have a system in place where it connects to an outside receiver which bounces to a leaky cable where we can get information and control it from there leaky cable yeah okay so basically in terms of controlling the vehicle the basic control that's all external yeah yeah, so, so all the processes are external. It's not like processing here, and somebody just has a remote control, nah. a, you know, a pack. Yeah. Which say there's a lot. So trains now, for example, you know, that a lot of them are remote con able to fully be controlled with a handheld remote control, like a toy remote control car. But this is not the case with this. This all your processing is within your lab. Yeah. And this is basically this is just a traction pack. This is just motor, a motor and some sort of uh, receiver to get the control signals. Yep. Slow down. Hundred percent. Yep. So for example, if you can adapt this to put a person in it, you don't have the, the the technology package is not in this vehicle, you have to develop a technology package. Yeah, yeah. So what's the, do you know the speeds and feeds while we wrap up this uh, interview? I'm not too sure I'm Top speed, acceleration. Uh, top speed of this is twelve hundred K an hour. And in terms of acceleration it'll be about one point five G. So from twelve hundred to um, uh, from zero to twelve hundred would take about a minute. And that gets to my next question: How is that going to affect passenger comfort or cargo? So it'd just be like taking off on an aircraft. So we want a more enjoyable ride for the passengers. So we can optimize that to accelerate at a rate that won't make them feel sick. Okay. So at the moment, you know, we can see we have different corporate sponsors. A lot of these corporate sponsors are in the tech space, in the transport space. Yep. Where where's things going? What's next for Vic Hyper? So next is research and. Development for um, Hyperloop technology, and then in about five years, hoping to get a test track to be able to test our systems, and then from there, we're looking at building a full Hyperloop system from so, Melbourne to Sydney. Uh, how, how, much, how, how are you hinging your bets in terms of the government versus the private sector? I mean, obviously, this is a lot of private sector here. So, where, where's it going? Where's the needle point? We're, we're hoping with more publicity, the government will get on board. We're already reducing the cost of tube manufacturing in the near future. So once they see that, hopefully they jump on board and realize that this is actually a good opportunity to improve innovation and transportation yeah. in Australia. So I'll thank you, Damien. And to close off this interview, 
I was quite candid in that when I saw the initial publicity of this project, I was a bit sceptical, considering I've been following, personally, I've been following these sorts of concepts for a number of years, and I thought, okay, this is just somebody's, uh, you know, pipe dream, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> and, but once now I've met you, and you've shown me the vehicle, and you explained to me the similarities between maglev technology and this vehicle, I'm a bit more uh, convinced now, because a lot of this is off the shelf, a lot of this is proven maglev technology, is for more than 40 years old now. Just the matter of you know, you know, put, making a package and tuning it, and just getting all the fine, uh, the fine details right. And obviously, getting the money. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, thank you, Damon, thank for you. talking to me, and I thank you for actually uh, putting me on the right track. Another pun, <laughs> and, and actually, you know, to so I know actually what's going on, rather than uh, rely on hype from the mass media. You know. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. Cheers.